Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Mullen Automotive stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Mullen Automotive is an electric car company. It owns CarHub, which is a chain of car dealerships in California and Arizona. It also owns Mullen Electric, which is focused on advancing battery technology. On November 5th, 2021, the company completed its merger with NetElement. NetElement was already a publicly traded company. So this is a traditional example of reverse merger, when a private company acquires a public company so they can go public. It's just a faster, cheaper way than a traditional IPO. Last year, the company announced they would be opening a factory in Memphis, Tennessee in order to manufacture their Mullen 5 crossover SUV. The company plans to build a prototype this year. This vehicle is a fully electric midsize luxury SUV with a range of 325 miles. It will have a starting price of $55,000 and go up to $75,000 with additional features. Product validation is expected to begin in the fourth quarter of 2023 with the first sale in the fourth quarter of 2024. The company is headquartered in Brea, California and was founded in 2014. The ticker trades on the NASDAQ and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a micro cap company, 82 million market cap. They're trading at 234 a share and they have 35 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Since they're pre-revenue, they have negative free cash flow each year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses, and that's also negative each year. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is their operating expenses. This is mainly payroll. And below that is their operating income, which is negative every year since they have no revenue. They don't have much debt anymore. This 43 million is the loss on debt settlement. Then you have other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses not part of the company's core operations. These should be the gains or losses on their subsidiaries because they don't have any revenue. If they owned more than 50% of CarHub, they would have to consolidate all their financials onto theirs, which means if CarHub had revenue, they would have to report revenue. But since they're reporting no revenue, they must own less than 50% of CarHub. If they own between 20% and 50% of CarHub, they would report that company's profit or loss onto their income statement and other income and expenses. If they own less than 20% of CarHub, they would use cost method accounting, which means they would capitalize the gain or loss on their balance sheet. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which of course is negative every year. This is the company's income statement from their latest 10Q. This is the fourth quarter of 2020 and the fourth quarter of 2021. They spent 13 million in GNA, 1.2 million in R&D. So they had a $14 million loss in the fourth quarter. Last year was 3.5 million. That gives them a net loss of $2 per share. That's only for the fourth quarter. Last year was a net loss of $1. And they increased their shares outstanding from 5 million to 17 and a half million. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. So they lost 32 million in the trailing 12 months. And then CapEx is investments in property, plant, and equipment. This 11 million went towards their factory in Tennessee. Operating cash flow minus CapEx give you your free cash flow. They're running their business on debt and equity. They added 18 million of debt in 2019, 12 million, 13 million, then 18 million. They did pay down 13 and a half million in the trailing 12 months. And they added five and a half million of stock in 2021, 36 million in the trailing 12 months. Their CapEx pretty much equals their investing cash flow. So they're doing everything organically. They're not doing any business acquisitions. This is the company's operating cash flow section. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net loss, then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then adjust for changes in working capital. They reported an accounting loss of 36 million, but actually lost 15 million of cash flow. In the fourth quarter of 2020, they reported an accounting loss of 5 million, but actually generated positive cash flow, 85,000. A lot of it is from these accrued expenses. 
So they accrued a lot of expenses, 2.7 million, and they did not pay those expenses. So it was like a cash inflow. But when they pay the expenses, then it'll be a cash outflow in that accounting period. In the fourth quarter of 2021, they had a cash outflow of 1.5 million. An example is an employee's bonus. Say they received their annual bonus of $12,000 in January 2022 for all of 2021. So every month, the company accrues $1,000 of expenses that it does not pay the employee. So it's like a cash inflow of $1,000, an accounting cash inflow. Then when the year is complete and January comes around, then it pays the employee $12,000. And then it's a cash outflow of 12,000. This 22 million of interest expense on the income statement, a majority of the 22 million is not interest they paid on their debt. It's this 19 million from amortization of debt discount. When a company sells bonds into the open market, they have a lot of expenses, registration fees, legal fees, underwriting costs, etc. And those expenses are amortized over the life of the bond. That's what that 19 million is. They also pass through 1.6 million of stock-based compensation. That's an expense on the income statement, but it's a non-cash item, so we add it back here. And they also issue 2.5 million of shares for services. Maybe a lawyer gave this company their services, and Mullen negotiated with the lawyer to give them shares of the company instead of cash. This is their investing and financing sections from their statement of cash flows. They spent 10 million in a purchase of equipment. This equipment is probably all for their factory in Tennessee. In the fourth quarter of 2021, in their financing section, they issued 7.3 million of notes, 11 million of common stock, and 20 million of preferred stock. They did pay down 13 million of notes. The company filed an S3 on 328, so just the other day. If a company wants to IPO or issue new stock, they have to file an S3 with the SEC. It's a pretty big document. It just gives a lot of information on the security offerings. They plan to issue 52 million shares of common stock, 5 million shares of Series C preferred stock, and almost 200 million shares of warrants. These 197 million warrants have an exercise price of 884. In the past, they issued 17 million warrants exercise price at 70 cents. They currently have 35 million shares outstanding at 234. If by chance a stock does get up to 884, that's a 279% stock price increase. But the share dilution would go up 462%. If it does hit 884, then a ton of stock dilution occurs and your stock price comes way back down well below 234. Why do you think big funds aren't buying this stock if it's so great? Because of stuff like this. This is the equity section on the 1231 balance sheet. They issue preferred and common stock. They raised $176 million. And they lost all of this money because their accumulated deficit is $187 million. So they received $176 million from selling their business. And then they had to take on some debt. That's why their losses are higher than additional paid in capital. So they have negative equity. Let's look at the capital structure. Negative 10 million of equity, 21 million of debt. So they're 100% debt. And they have no cash on their balance sheet. So their net debt is also 21 million. I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 11.5%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 214 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $82 million. We divide that by 35 million shares. So we get a calculated stock price of 235, the trading at 234. I didn't really value this company like I normally do. I just showed you one scenario of what their future free cash flows would need to be to justify a $2.34 stock price. The average company in their industry converts 8% of their revenue into free cash flow. So if they get 235 million of revenue in 2025 and convert 8% of that into free cash flow, that would give them $19 million. Of course, we know the stock price is not based off of how well the company's doing financially because they're pre-revenue. It's based off of the future expectation of what the company will do. When the company did the reverse merger, they started trading pretty high at over $12.50 a share. But the stock price got really, really low, down 52 cents at the lowest. 
but I think there's been somewhat of a short squeeze going on. Lots of people have really been into the stock. I'm not exactly sure why, but they have been. These big green lines indicate lots of buying activity. That's why the stock price came up so much. It has been regressing. So if you like gambling, it could be a great gamble and you could make a lot of money. Of course, like gambling, you may lose a lot of money as well. Since this stock started trading, the S&P is almost flat, while this stock is down 80%. At one point, it was down about 95%. It's crazy how popular this company is. Over 275 million shares are traded each day the past 10 trading days. 10 million shares traded is a lot in one day. Of the 35 million shares outstanding, 4.5 million are on float. 4% are held by institutions, and 43% of the shares are shorted. Their employee count has been coming down the past few months. They currently employ 44 people. So far this year, there's been no insider buying, just selling. 230,000 shares have been sold, both by the same person. David Mitchery is the CEO of this company. Individual insiders own 61% of the company and institutions 39%. Two people each own 52% of the company. So the shares outstanding for this company don't include the rules for math. I think this probably means they own 52% combined, which would give them about 26% each. The CEO of the company owns 23% of it, then two other individuals own a bunch of stock. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. We can't look at the price of sales since they have no sales. And we cannot look at the price to book since they have negative equity. Let's look at their non-current assets. They have 13.1 million of PP&E. They have 2.3 million of intangible assets. This may include patents or trademarks. 2.2 million of right of use assets. This may be equipment or machinery they lease from another company. And 4.3 million of other. Let's look at their non-current liabilities. 238,000 of notes, 1.7 million of lease liabilities, and 5.6 million of other. They can cover half their current liabilities with their current assets. So their current ratio is 0.5, same thing with the quick ratio. Let's look at their current assets. They have $360 of cash. I have more cash in my wallet. 61,000 in restricted cash. Restricted cash is cash that's set aside for a specific purpose, like to buy a piece of equipment, for example. 55,000 in materials. 6.5 million of prepaid expenses. This is when a company makes an advance payment for a product or service they're going to receive in the future. 1.7 million of other and 15 million of notes. Let's look at their current liabilities. 4.2 million of accounts payable. This is how much money they owe others. 18 million of accrued expenses. These are expenses the company has incurred but has not paid it yet. They're in debt 6.3 million of their common stock. So they owe someone 6.3 million dollars worth of their stock. 620,000 of lease liabilities and 19 million of notes payable. Lots of debt. They had negative 43 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and they have negative 25 million of working capital. So they're short 68 million dollars. So they will need debt or equity financing to get through the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 34 companies in the same industry as Mullen and Mullen ranks 31st in market cap and their ratios are worse than average because they're pre-revenue. Not only are they pre-revenue, they have no cash. So to summarize, this company looks really risky, but I know everybody's looking for the next Tesla. I don't think this is going to be it, but I've definitely been wrong before. I ranked their free cash flows, revenue, and ratios 1 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.